Not really? Pretty confident? Too nice outside. Too nice. Yeah, it was too nice outside. It was so nice outside, I forgot to write the exam. So, true. <laughs> I did, so I've got to write it tonight instead of writing it this weekend. So, yes. So now I'll do the review session, and I'll know what all you guys don't know so I can go on. I, that's not how it works. That's not what I do. All right, so what I'm going to do is uh, lecture on uh, translation. And then at the end of the lecture, I will do review session uh, tonight, as I said before. And I'll videotape that. I will post the review session video um, hopefully tonight. I'm pretty sure I can do that. And you can have that if you want to watch that and get all the little morsels of information out of it. OK? All right, so last time uh, when I finished, I had just uh, started talking about the initiation of translation. That's where I'd like to start today, OK? So translation, I will remind you, is the synthesis of protein. And translation occurs in ribosomes. And the information for translation comes from the messenger RNA which in turn comes from the DNA. OK. So those are the important considerations uh, for translation. Now, translation um, in prokaryotic cells occurs in the cytoplasm. That's because all there is. There's no organelles in, uh, in prokaryotic cells. They only have a cytoplasm. So it turns out that during transcription in prokaryotes, Translation can actually get started while transcription is going on. On that same piece of RNA, that as it's being made, translation can actually get started. And that's kind of an interesting and cool thing. That doesn't happen in eukaryotes, as we'll see later. Okay. Well, in order for translation to occur, the ribosomal complex has to assemble. And there's an orchestrated series of events that make that happen. So I'm going to step you through those events. I'm, I'm, believe me, it may sound a little complex, but I'm saving you a lot of steps in the process. So I'm trying to keep it as simple as I can so that you can understand as much as you can of the process. All right. Well, you may recall I said that the ribosome has two subunits, one big complex called the 50S and one smaller complex called the 30S. And these complexes contain both proteins and ribosomal RNAs. Okay, they contain both proteins and ribosomal RNAs. The ribosomal RNAs have important functions, as we shall see. Okay. Now, in the initiation process, the first step happens when the small subunit gets bound to some proteins called initiation factors, IF. IF. And these initiation factors, um, as you can see here, they're called IF1, there's an IF3, and there's also over here bound to the initiator tRNA IF2. So basically we have three initiation factors that help the process to get started. IF1, IF2, IF3. I don't even care if you know where they are. Just as long as you know that there's three initiation factors that are proteins that help the process to get started. Well, what they do is they help to grab the messenger RNA and get it properly lined up with the right place on the 30S RNA. That's where the process is going to occur. So it's important that that messenger RNA get properly positioned. That's part of the role of those initiation factors is to make sure that that messenger RNA is properly positioned. Now, when I talked about prokaryotic cells the other day, I pointed out that there was a sequence very next, or right next to the AUG that will start translation called the Shine Delgarno sequence. You can see it right there. And the initiation factors and the ribosome use that to help align the messenger RNA in the right place. So they want to put this AUG, in this case, right in the middle of this uh, ribosome, or this, this ribosome uh, subunit, as you can see. Okay? Now, how do they know how to do that? Well, they know how to do that because this ribosomal subunit contains a ribosomal RNA called the 16S, 
ribosomal RNA. The 16S ribosomal RNA has a sequence that's complementary to the Shindogarno sequence. So it's really easy. You line up base pairs, and now everything lines up. It's very simple. So the 16S ribosomal RNA, which is inside of this guy, that is the ribosomal subunit, the 16S has a sequence that's complementary to the Shindogarno, and when they base pair, this guy is all lined up and ready to go. Okay. Once that process has happened, and you'll notice down here that this is actually a tRNA that's linked to the 4-mil-methionine, that's the very first amino acid that's going to go into this prokaryotic uh, protein. It's all lined up, as you can see here. Right? The next thing that happens is the large subunit is brought in, and all the initiation factors go flying away. Now, when we're at this point, we're at the end of the initiation phase. We're at the end of the initiation phase. And when we look at this schematic diagram on the very bottom, we see a couple of things. One, first of all, 30S plus, 30S plus 50S gives 70S. They're not additive, but 70S is bigger than either one of those. So this whole complex is called the 70S complex. Second thing we see is that there are three sites there in pink. You see a site there, a site there, and a site there. Okay? These three sites in pink that are on here will have important roles during the elongation phase of protein synthesis. And I'll talk about that in the next uh, step. Okay? Now, one of the things that we see happen, that I didn't point out, but I should point out, is during this process, GTP got bound by this complex. And down here you see that GTP got cleaved as everything was leaving. All right? This tells us that energy from GTP is necessary to get the process started. Now it's interesting, we talk about ATP being the, the gasoline of the cell, the energy source of the cell. But in fact, during protein synthesis, all of the energy of protein synthesis comes from GTP, not ATP. Everything in protein synthesis uses GTP. You've seen the first one right there. Okay. Questions about that? Yeah. It's 70, yeah. They don't add. Yeah. It, the, the numbers relate to uh, measures on centrifuges, and so they're not additive in, in nature. Yeah. yeah. Say it again. So it's the same as the phosphate in, a, in ATP. Exactly the same. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, um, here's the Shindogarno sequence. And all, all this is doing is showing you the fact that the Shindogarno sequence. Um, is uh, aligned. We won't mess with that. Let's not mess with that. All right. Let's look at the process of elongation. So now here's that ribosome that we just assembled. All right. They flipped it upside down from where it was before. The large subunit now is on the top. The small subunit is on the bottom. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Now, here's those three pink things I talked about before. And you see they now have letters. This guy here is called the A. The one farthest on the right is the A site. The one in the middle where the transfer RNA is found is called the P site. And the one on the far left is called the E site. E stands for exit because it's from this site that the transfer RNA will be kicked out after uh, the peptide bond has been formed. Okay? All right. So the thing you see at the very top is what the product was of the initiation phase. During elongation, new transfer RNAs are going to come in. 
They're going to have their amino acids joined to the previous amino acids. And then the ribosome is going to slide down one more codon. And the process will continue. Okay? That's basically what's going to happen when we think about the overall big picture of protein synthesis. All right. So here we see another transfer RNA coming in with uh, an amino acid attached to it. Okay? This figure is not very anatomically correct. I'll tell you why in just a second. It's carrying a GTP, so it's got some energy it's carrying with it. And this guy is going to come in to the A site. So all of the incoming transfer RNAs come into the A site. This guy's coming into the A site. When it comes into the A site, this protein here called EFTU, very important protein, EFTU. It's the most abundant protein in, in the entire E. coli cell. And the job of this protein is to cover up the bond between the transfer RNA and the amino acid. You may remember last time I said that bond was very unstable. And if it encounters water, it will fall apart. That's why this is not anatomically correct, because the EFTU is actually covering this right here. Okay? But what it's doing, EFTU, is protecting that bond from water. Water is not getting access because of EFTU there. That's a very important point. Okay. Now, another thing that EFTU does is when the transfer RNA comes in, remember the transfer RNA has the anticodon. That's the thing that's complementary to the codon in the messenger RNA. Not all of the transfer RNAs will be complementary. In fact, most of them are not going to be complementary to that codon. So if they come in and they do not base pair properly, then EFTU will pull it out of there and take it away. So if they don't base pair properly, EFTU will remove the transfer RNA from the ribosome. Now, if, we, if they are paired properly, as they are here, if they are paired properly, then what will happen is EFTU will cleave GTP, and it will exit as well. Actually, it's, it's up here. Cleave, cleave and exit right here. Okay? So if it comes in, it pairs properly, EFTU will cleave GTP, and it will leave. It's leaving behind this perfectly paired two sets of transfer RNAs in the ribosome. OK. Well, the next step is the most important one, because that's the step where the peptide bond is formed. The peptide bond is formed in the next step. All right. You can see the peptide bond is a little red bar right there. And the peptide bond is catalyzed, as the formation of the peptide bond is catalyzed not by an enzyme, but instead by a ribozyme. The ribozyme that, ca that catalyzes the formation of the peptide bond is the 23S ribosomal RNA. That guy is located in the large subunit. So we see that both the 16S and the 23S have very important functions in translation. The 16S had the, the complementary sequence to the shine dogarno sequence, which was important in initiation. The 23S contain, has the ribozyme activity that forms the peptide bond that's important in elongation. So now we see these two guys have been joined. All right? And we see them joined over here. We see they're joined to the incoming, to the, what was the incoming transfer RNA. The previous transfer RNA now is empty. It's going to slide down to the E site, which is what's happening next, and get kicked out of the ribosome. That process occurs because the ribosome does what we call translocation. That is, it moves one codon down to the right. And I'll remind you that translation occurs in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, just like 
transcription does, just like replication does. So everything's occurring five prime to three prime. In this case, it's moving to the right. And moving the ribosome down the, the messenger RNA requires energy. The energy comes from your friend GTP. It also requires action of another protein called EFG. That's a simple one to remember, EFG. Okay. Now, why is it called EF? Well, EF stands for elongation factor. So the initiation phase uses IFs, proteins, which are initiation factor proteins. The elongation phase uses EF proteins, which are called elongation factor proteins. Now, once this process has happened down at the bottom, another transfer RNA will come in, and this process will continue on and on and on until a stop codon is encountered. The stop codon is at three base sequence. That's either UAA, UAG, or UGA. When one of those appears in the A site, translation is going to stop. When that happens, we're in the termination phase of protein synthesis. But before I go to that, I'll take any questions that you might have of what I've just told you here. Yes? Good question. So when she says when the tRNAs go out of the ribosome, do they get degraded or do they go back or what do they do? Well, remember at this point, it's lost its amino acid. So the next thing that's going to happen is this guy is going to end up binding with the enzyme Bob. You may remember from last time. Okay? And Bob is going to put the proper amino acid on there and then it's going to come back in here and do the same thing over and over. Okay? Yes? What is EFTU protecting? So this bond between the, amino, between the transfer RNA and the amino acid is very water unstable. So actually, this EFTU really should be sitting on here. It's protecting that bond. Okay. Yeah. So when the uh-huh. That's right. Yeah, her question is, how often does a wrong one come in? The answer is about 19 times out of 20, a wrong one's going to come in. Now, this is what's remarkable about the process, because this is a very complicated process. We have, and it's all driven by diffusion. There's nothing that's directing the right one in there. It has to diffuse in. Does it fit? If not, it has to, it has to be taken back out by the EFTU. All right? This is happening, and 19 times out of 20, it's basically going to have the wrong one in there. A little scary thought, isn't it? Okay. What's amazing is this process occurs synthesizing a protein at the rate of about 20 amino acids per second. About 20 amino acids per second get put into a protein. And that says, well, that's, that's not a thousand bases, base pairs per second like DNA replication, but it's still moving pretty fast considering all the things that it has to wait on in order for the right one to get in there. Question back there. Are there different EFTUs or is the same one used? The answer is basically they're all the same with one exception. One very minor exception. Anybody, and you guys have actually seen it, but I bet you didn't think about it. Anybody can tell me the one exception? If you can, I'll give you a five point extra credit. The one exception, so the, his question was, are all EFTUs the same or not? And if not, what would the exception be? And I've already told you something that might constitute the exception. Yes? Would glycines be different? No. Not the stop codon, no. Not the FMET. Not methionine. Think about what's EFTU doing? There's a hint. It's protecting. Yes, sir. Is there a repressor? No. Think about what EFTU is doing. Yes. 
It is protecting you from water. And that's the, that's, if you think about that, maybe you'll get this. Yes? No, not the single strand binding proteins. Not the hydroxyl groups. No. Nope. Everyone wants to have five points. <laughs> You're probably going to be mad at me when I tell you what the answer is. Go ahead. No? No, nope, not the polar and hydrophobic. No. Nope. OK. You saw it on the last slide. OK. So what was happening on the last slide? OK. See anything on there that looks like it might need any protection? What's that initiator tRNA doing? Yeah, but what does it have on it? It's got an amino acid on it, right? Is that bond going to be unstable? Yes, just like all bonds between tRNAs and amino acids are unstable. That IFTU is very much like EFTU because it's going to cover that bond and keep it from water. So that's the only exception to that, to that rule right there. Is IFTU is very much like EFTU and has the same basic function. All right, sorry. I did give you guys extra credit on Friday, though. No, I didn't. That was Thursday, wasn't it? Okay. No, it was Wednesday. We don't have class on Thursday. There's too many, <laughs> there are too few thoughts going in. in on here. Okay. Now, termination. All right, so termination um, happens when a stop codon appears in the A site. When a stop codon appears in the A site. Here you can see a UAA, it's sitting there in the A site, and what happens at this point is there's, there are no transfer RNAs that have a sequence in their anticodon that's complementary to that. So none of the transfer RNAs that, that carry amino acids will, will, will come in there and do anything. Instead, there are release factors that come in. Here's something called a release factor. And if you want to call it RF, that's fine too. Okay. Release factor comes in and it fits in that A site. And the release factor carries one molecule. What is the one molecule that that release factor would carry that would stop the process? No, not a stop codon. I'll give two points of extra credit for the first person to get that one. This one you can guess. Not row factor. Who said, who said over here? Water. Water it is. It carries a molecule of water. Okay? And that molecule of water, guess where it puts it? Right next to this bond over here. Because this, this guy has been covered up in the ribosome. There's nothing in the contents of the ribosome that has any water. It puts that water molecule right there, and the water molecule cuts the bond, and look what happens. The protein comes off. When that happens, the whole system falls apart, and protein synthesis is done. Yes? So right here, right there where that... that polypeptide chain is joined to the transfer RNA in the P site. Okay. So it applies that water right there, that breaks the bond, and everything flies apart. That's pretty remarkable. This whole process is going on in water, and you think about all the things that the cell has to do to keep that bond from getting exposed to water. It tells you that EFTU is a very important protein because it would be a total waste of the cell's energy to make a bond between the amino acid and the tRNA and then water just break it apart. That's the reason why EFTU is the most abundant protein in E. coli. You've got to have plenty of excess of that so you can so sop up all of those tRNAs as soon as they get an amino acid on them. Okay, other questions on this? Okay. Moving along. Now, protein synthesis is a target of action for many antibiotics. Many antibiotics.
Now, the process that occurs in eukaryotic cells is very similar to what occurs in prokaryotic cells, but some of the structures are, in fact, slightly different. And they're different enough that we can target specific structures in prokaryotic translation that don't affect eukaryotic translation. So they stop protein synthesis in prokaryotes, but not in eukaryotes. That's important for an antibiotic because you don't want to kill your cells in the process of killing the bacteria. Okay? One antibiotic is known as puromycin. I'm just going to show you its mechanism of action because it's fairly easy to understand. All right? Puromycin looks a heck of a lot like an amino acid attached to a tRNA. All right? It looks a heck of a lot like that. Here is um, an amino acid attached to a tRNA. Okay? This is, the, this is the amino acid part of it right here. Here's the TNA, tRNA part of it over here. This looks virtually identical to it in this region, except it doesn't have the tRNA attached to it. Puromycin, what happens is it will bind in the A site of the ribosome beautifully. But because there's not a transfer RNA attached to it, elongation gets all gummed up. So when the prokaryotic cell gets pyromycin, what happens is this guy plugs up the ribosome and stops protein synthesis. It doesn't come out. Very effective way to stop a cell from growing and ultimately to kill the cell because proteins are necessary for the cell to be alive. There are other proteins that target other, I'm sorry, there are other antibiotics that target other proteins in the ribosome. And I won't talk about those, but suffice it to say that there are many, many translational inhibitors that exist because that's uh, one of the most important processes that a cell can undergo. Okay. Um, no, we don't need to talk about that. All right, let's talk about eukaryotic cells. So, as I said, many of the steps in prokaryotic cells are there in eukaryotic cells. And what I'll do with this is, just like I did transcription, I'll talk about the differences, and everything else will be the same, okay? All right, so some of the differences. First of all, in eukaryotic cells, Translation occurs in the cytoplasm, but transcription occurs in the nucleus. So transcription and translation are occurring in different places in the cell. In bacteria, they're both occurring in the same place. So in eukaryotic cells, transcription and translation are occurring in different places. The ribosomes are bigger in eukaryotic cells, but they have the same basic functions. Right? We're not, we don't need to worry about their sizes because it doesn't, all it's going to do is just give you a bunch of more information that you don't really need to know. Their sizes are bigger. Okay? Their ribosomal RNAs are bigger. They, the eukaryote, eukaryotes use a ribozyme to make a peptide bond just like prokaryotic cells do. Eukaryotic cells are using the same genetic code as the prokaryotic cells. Okay. All these things are similar. Now, one difference is that the shine delgarno sequence in eukaryotes does not exist. There's not a shine delgarno sequence in eukaryotic cells. Well, how does the ribosome know where to start? That was a problem in prokaryotic cells. In eukaryotic cells, the answer is fairly simple. Usually, the first AUG that the ribosome hits is the one it starts synthesis on. That wasn't the case in prokaryotic cells. Usually, the first AUG that the ribosome hits as it goes sliding down, it doesn't start at the end, just like in prokaryotic cells, it doesn't start at the end, but it'll get on the end, it'll start sliding, and all of a sudden it hits an AUG and it knows where to start because it's the first one that it gets to. Okay? We see an assembly process that occurs in eukaryotic cells that's very much like the assembly process that occurs in prokaryotic cells. 
Okay? Now, some of the differences that we've seen okay, relate to structure. This schematically shows the structure that I described to you in class when I talked about eukaryotic messenger RNAs. All right? Here's the cap on the 5 prime end. This is this unusual structure that protects the 5 prime end from nucleases. Okay? Here's the first AUG. Ribosome comes along here, slides along, and says, OK, there it is. There's the place to start. Here's the poly A sequence at the end. Okay? The poly A, actually, it's right here, but here's the poly A sequence that's been added to the end. Both the cap and the poly A sequence in eukaryotic cells have roles in translation. We'll see that in just a second. Okay. Um, I'll leave that be. Okay. Here's what that complex looks like all right, at initiation of eukaryotic cells. Don't worry about the names, but you can see IF is an initiation factor. Uh, there's an IF that's an initiation factor. There's an IF that's an initiation factor. There's an IF. I don't think you want to memorize all those names. You don't need to. Okay. But suffice it to say that these initiation factors are set up to make this thing like a looped structure. One end is bound to the poly A. The other end is bound to the cap. Why make a loop? Why do that? Okay. Well, it's not completely clear, but it appears that it might make sense for a ribosome, when it, once it binds to this and gets started, that it goes along, it translates, it translates, it gets up here, it hits the stop codon, and instead of just flying apart, it's now very close to the next place to start again. So keeping it in a circle like this might actually help the ribosome to make more protein. Okay. Now, elongation proceeds. Again, a lot of different names of proteins and so forth, but nothing that I'm going to talk about that's anything different from what we had in prokaryotic cells. Again. We have protein, we have transfer RNAs that really can't be exposed to water when they're attached to an amino acid. That is, that, that bond can't be exposed. Same considerations there that we had in prokaryotic cells. Now, one of the differences in eukaryotic cells is that the first amino acid is still methionine, but remember in prokaryotic cells, you put that formyl group on it. Eukaryotic cells don't have that formyl group. They don't need it. Okay. Prokaryotic cells have to have it. And it's, again, there's a chemical reason that's why, and eukaryotic cells are set up a little bit differently. But suffice it to say that eukaryotic cells start with just pure, unadulterated methionine. No formula group put onto it. Termination happens, and it happens in a manner very similar uh, to prokaryotic cells. And basically, at that point, you're done. All right. Now. After a protein is made, they, they can be modified. You've seen a little bit of this already. We saw, for example, phosphorylation. Phosphorylation is a post-translational modification, meaning it occurs after translation is complete. So if you put a phosphate onto an amino acid, that happens after the protein has been made, not before. All right. We've seen how zymogens got converted into active, pro active enzymes by cleavage of peptide bonds, right? That was post-translational. Of course, it occurred after the protein had been made. Insulin is a really good example of something <coughs> that gets cleaved uh, to make mature insulin. So here's um, DNA codes for RNA, which codes for the synthesis of insulin, right? Insulin is made in several steps. The first step involves something called pre-pro-insulin. And you can see that insulin is synthesized as a single chain, and it has a variety of sulfhydryl groups on it. Those sulfhydryl groups get oxidized to make disulfide bonds, like you see here. And those disulfide bonds now help to hold the overall complex together. 
first this end piece is cut off and then next this middle piece is cut off so that everything, if it weren't held together by these disulfide bonds, would go flying apart. But it doesn't go flying apart, it stays together and insulin then of course has the function in our body of telling cells to take up glucose. Tell cells to take up glucose. So that's how insulin is made. Um, and again, these are post-translational. They're occurring after translation has occurred. Okay. Another thing uh, that's important is cells have um, a necessary, shall we say, um, recycling center. We used to call it a garbage cleaner, but we call it a recycling center. Okay. Proteins get damaged over time, just like DNA gets damaged over time. Proteins, the cell doesn't want to have around forever. So cells have a targeting mechanism that tell structures inside the cell, break down this protein. Okay? The structure that breaks down proteins inside of the cell is called a proteasome. P-R-O-T-E-A-S-O-M-E. -E. A proteasome is a structure inside of a cell that breaks down proteins. It's basically recycling them. It's, it's taking, breaking them down, letting amino acids be released so that more proteins can be made. Okay. Um, Oh yes, and one last consideration here. We talk a lot about the fact that there are 20 amino acids that get put into um, proteins. And that's true. There is one that people refer to as the 21st amino acid. And the reason they call it the 21st amino acid is it does get synthesized into proteins during the translational process. Okay. Now, it's a little complicated about how it gets in there, so I'm not going to take you through that. But I will tell you that it's known as selenocysteine. The reason they call it selenocysteine is if I had this basic structure right here, and instead of that SE over here, I had an, an SH, meaning it was a sulfhydro bond, that would be cysteine. So what this has is selenium that has replaced sulfur at the sulfur's position. Okay. This guy is made into proteins. All right? Not very commonly, and there's not very many proteins that have it, but some of the proteins that have this amino acid absolutely require it. This is the reason why selenium is a trace nutrient in your diet, because you have a very tiny amount of need to put this into certain proteins. Now, selenium is a very poisonous substance. So when you take selenium supplements, they're giving you very tiny amounts of selenium because you don't want to have too much selenium or you're going to have problems. You've heard, if you're a rancher, you may have heard of high selenium grass and things like that that can actually be, uh, pose problems. Okay? But you do need to have a little bit of selenium in your diet and you get selenium in your diet, um, usually without any problem. And this then allows you to make these proteins that require the selenocysteine residue in them. So selenocysteine is the 21st amino acid. And I've already talked about chaperones before, but I'll remind you that chaperones are complexes that allow proteins to fold properly. They're complexes that allow proteins to fold properly. All right. Now, I've just told you a bunch of stuff. We're actually even a little bit ahead of where we need to be. So rather than dive into something new, um, I thought I would finish with a song, and then we would have a review session, unless anybody has any questions. Yes? Does selenocysteine contribute to any secondary tertiary structure? Probably every amino acid does contribute to some overall structure of a protein. But in the case of selenocysteine, it's, it's more likely that it's playing roles in the active site, helping to catalyze uh, reactions. Yes, sir? Yeah, it's a good question. What codon is it? 
It turns out, as I said, it gets into the protein in an unusual way. It actually goes in the place of a stop codon, and it takes an unusual structure in the ribosome to, to in the, in the ribosomal RNA for it to occur to allow this to happen. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's going in the place of a stop codon. Do you have a question also? That was your question. Yes? Yeah, it'd be nice if proteasomes attacked prions and you didn't have that be a problem, but as far as I know, they don't. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to turn the proteasomes loose. The proteasomes, I didn't say, and I, I won't hold you responsible for this, but I will tell you, since I'm, you've asked the question, um, the proteasomes know which proteins to attack by the fact that the cell puts a little flag on them. Okay? And there's a, there's a protein called ubiquitin that, that is put on to proteins that are, be degrade, that are to be degraded. And that's how it knows which ones to do. OK, how about a song? This is an easy one. Good protein synthesis. Amino acids cannot join by themselves together. They require ribosomes to create the tether. All the protein chains get made according to instruction carried by mRNA in peptide bond construction. Small subunit starts it all with initiation, pairing up to RNAs at the docking station. Shine Del Garno's complement in the 16S's, lines the AUG up so synthesis commences. Elongation happens in ribosomic insides where our RNA creates bonds for polypeptides. These depart the ribosome, passing right straight through it in the tiny channels there of the large subunit. Finally, when the sequence of one of the stop codons parks itself in the A site, synthesis can't go on. P-side RNA lets go of what it was holding so the polypeptide can get on with its folding. All right. Okay, why don't we take about a two-minute break, um, and then I will uh, start the review session. How